Welcome to Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Stephen Clark, editor of Space Flight Now. We're trying something new this afternoon. This is uh, the, our first pilot episode of what we're calling News from the Press Site. And uh, with me today, I have two uh, esteemed veteran space reporters, Irene Klott, senior space editor for Aviation Week and Space Technology, and Bill Harwood, uh, space consultant for CBS News. Uh, both of them are based here in the Cape Canaveral area. Thanks for joining us, guys. Glad to be here. So earlier this morning, we were covering uh, the launch of a Starlink mission on a Falcon 9 rocket from uh, just a few miles south of here at Pad 40. Uh, that mission began at 10.50 a.m. Eastern Time uh, with liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket. And the Falcon 9 booster made a successful landing on the drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, uh, located uh, a few hundred miles downrange from uh, Cape Canaveral. And this uh, particular mission marked the uh, tenth flight of this booster, Booster 1062. And here we're showing a replay of the landing sequence, uh, the first stage engine firing uh, for the landing burn to guide that uh, rocket into the drone ship for a soft landing, again, about 400 miles downrange from the Cape. Uh, a What has become a fairly routine site launches and landings of Falcon boosters, and this one uh, was the 48th. Uh, launch of a Falcon 9 rocket this year. And uh, again, this has been a, a fairly routine site, especially with these Starlink missions this year, uh, number 48. And if you could bring up the next slide, Stephen. Uh, this particular mission uh, set a record, according to uh, Elon Musk, for the most number of flights of a, uh, of a rocket, of a space rocket in a year, number 48. And SpaceX has already broken its own record uh, earlier this year at 31, and again, this is number 48 this year, and uh, this was the 46th launch of uh, a space launch from Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center so far this year. Next slide, Stephen. Uh, and this chart shows the rapid growth in the number of uh, space launches from Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Uh, num number 46 this year, by far the lion's share of those has, have been from SpaceX, a half dozen from ULA, and then there were two uh, launch attempts from Astra earlier this year from the Cape as well. And I want to talk to Irene first, who uh, wrote a wonderful story uh, back in June about how SpaceX is making uh, rocket reuse more routine, especially with the Falcon fleet. And she had a great story uh, published in her uh, Aviation Week magazine earlier this year. Uh, can you talk to us about what you learned from pursuing that story, reporting that story, and and how SpaceX is making this happen. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, happy to. So there's a bit of a backstory to how that article came about, which is uh, Aviation Week has a pretty big um, footprint in the in the industry of uh, aircraft maintenance, repair, and overhaul, um, abbreviated MRO. And many years ago, uh, at one of the Av Week MRO conferences. Uh, one of the organizers noticed that there were some SpaceX people attending and they got all excited and said, oh, we want to do, like they said, oh, can we do a piece about uh, about rocket reuse? You know, we really want to do this. And I kind of laughed and it turned out they were not presenting at the conference. They were just there to poke around. Well, fast forward um, a few, several years, probably not even that many. And uh, it dawned on me that SpaceX was now like getting ready for its second 12th flight. And uh, it occurred to me that it was very quickly moving into this era of MRO. So um, uh, SpaceX uh, liked the story, liked the idea, and uh, had set up interviews with uh, Bill Gerstenmeyer, whom, of course, I had known from all his years at, at uh, NASA and several other uh, managers at SpaceX to kind of take me through how they're doing this. And uh, it, it comes down to... Um, constantly reiterating what they're doing. So every time something flies, they look to see what they can take out of the process the next time around. And this is a little different, um, well, it's a lot different than like how NASA handled the shuttle program, which very rarely would you ever have a requirement come off. And at the end, you'd have a just a marathon uh, um, task to turn shuttles around between flight. SpaceX also has been doing things like uh, dropping um, the requirements for how often they have to do a static fire um, if they have an engine change out, or even if they're doing something with like the turbo wheels. So it's just been this 
ongoing, um, this ongoing evolution. Um, so at the reporting of this in June, uh, the goal was to get to 15 flights with a single booster before they would uh, tear it up and look at it. And based on their manifest, they really didn't think that there'd be a need to go beyond 15 flights per booster. Of course, it's SpaceX, so that may change. And um, I think one of the things that's really stuck me is that uh, stuck with me is that they've been able to achieve this really incredible flight rate, and they really don't even have that many boosters. At the time of the reporting on the article, they had a total of uh, 21 in the fleet, and those were um, like 10 single stick and two converted Falcon Heavy side boosters that were now flying as singles, and then. Um, uh, for uh, uh, Falcon Heavy cores, which I guess we're going to get ready to see one of those pretty soon. So um, yeah, now they're what? They have two with uh, 14 flights. So I would say they're going to get to that 15 number possibly before the end of the year. And, you know, we've seen SpaceX, the original, the original life limit, so to speak, for a Block 5 booster was 10 missions. Now we're talking 15. So do you think they'll extend that even farther based on what we've seen them do pushing the envelope uh, to date? Uh, they might, I could see them doing it as a test, but um, unless they have uh, additional demand for Falcon 9 flights, I don't know. They were saying they don't know that they need to continue to push it. As you know, there's a whole nother program there want to get started. So uh I don't know. We'll we'll have to see. At the time, there was uh, there was not a need to like see how far you could push the fleet leader. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. In, in my reporting uh, last week, there was a launch for Intelsat, and uh, they have a launch. Their next launch, Intelsat's next launch on SpaceX in November, will be an expendable mission. So they're going to expend the booster, and uh, the same is the case, I believe, for a Utilsat mission in November. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see which boosters they select for those expendable missions that they drop boosters from the fleet uh, the next month. But uh, yeah, it was a great story, Irene. Thanks for uh, giving us a briefing on on what you learned Thanks, from SpaceX Stephen. there. Yeah, uh, Stephen, can I jump yeah. in real quick? Go ahead, Bill. I just want to one two observations on something Irene said that, that caught my uh, caught my ear. You know, this whole idea about about how NASA would never do that. I remember. George Page, the first shuttle launch director, telling me one time, you know, there's four primary computers on the shuttle and a backup. Why can't we launch if one of them fails before we take off? And of course, NASA would never, ever do that. Um, you know, I think SpaceX's willingness to fail and uh, their high and their high flight rate gives them a huge advantage, I think, over their competitors because they can flight test this equipment, find problems, fix it, and be ready to fly again in pretty short order. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you could do that with an Atlas or a Delta, for example. Uh, you, you'd be down for a longer period of time trying to get things worked out. Uh, but SpaceX has found a, a model that works for them, and it's uh, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, thanks for chiming in, Bill. And it's interesting that the the risk-averse nature of, of NASA that we've become accustomed to as, as space reporters, and now we're becoming accustomed to a whole new paradigm, like a new reality with SpaceX. And, and it's interesting, in my own mind, thinking about which one – makes more sense to me and and uh it's definitely a, a a clash of cultures i don't know if that if that's the right term bill that you would use but uh we're seeing nasa and spacex work together on the human landing system they've established a, a good track record so far with commercial crew and how do you think that relationship between nasa and spacex is, go, is going so far bill you know I, I wish i could say i know but i don't and that's one of the problems we have with this public private um evolution we've seen in the last several years, you know, the companies want to keep things proprietary and they don't share information about these schedules. And NASA, as the customer in this case, is let is is okay to let that happen. It's disturbing as a uh, as space reporters, I'm sure you both would agree or maybe not, but you know, the lack of insight of these programs is such that I cannot answer your question. Uh, based on SpaceX's progress, it's hard to to question their ability to meet uh, uh, tough engineering goals. They've clearly done that. You know, watching that Starlink uh, first stage land today, I was struck in real time as it was happening. I was watching that on their video going, it's 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 still remarkable. You know, even though they've done this so many times, when you watch it, it, it you know, it's like, really? Really? They're going to make this work? And they do. So I'm not trying to say that I think there's any issue here. I'm just simply saying we don't have any insight 
and that's a that's a disturbing a disturbing aspect of all this to me at least. Yeah, yeah. Irene, do you have something to share? Yeah, I would just say that NASA obviously is very willing to uh, push the envelope um, with SpaceX. I know we're going to discuss a little bit later about this proposal by SpaceX to uh, go visit Hubble and do a reboost. But you know, the fact that uh, the the program of record, the Artemis program, is is dependent on Starship is something quite extraordinary, I think, for you know, the government funded taxpayer supported program. And I think it's, it, it, they'll make it work, uh, but it's, it's, it's a different kind of gamble than what traditionally has unfolded in kind of cost plus a world, or cost plus award fee world of contracting where we're used to delays and budget overruns. Now it's, um, the whole path of the technology development is a little bit, as Bill was saying, it's a little bit of a mystery. And it's also a little bit of a, oh, trust me, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get this all worked out. So it's, uh, I don't know, it seems a little dicey sometimes. Also, I wonder about if the government gets so used to having things provided by the commercial companies based on what the commercial companies want to do, you know, where, what about the national will and what about the, uh, you know, objectives that governments have and governments fund. So it's kind of like a, it's a, it's got a flip side to it. Yeah. The competing national priority and commercial priority could become, I could foresee that becoming an issue sometime down the road. Um, but I, I want to close that discussion there and take you, take you down that road of cost plus world, which is uh, the space launch system. And we've, <laughs> we've been waiting uh, for this launch for years and we're gonna have to wait a little longer now. NASA is currently targeting uh, no earlier than November the 14th for the Artemis one mission after uh, launch attempts back in August and early September were uh, cut short by some technical issues, including most notably a, another hydrogen leak. Uh, the rocket rolled back to the uh, vehicle assembly building as you can see in this uh, image uh, to take refuge from Hurricane Ian a few weeks ago, and it's preparing to uh, roll back out to the pad um, in a few weeks' time to prepare for that next launch attempt on November the 14th. Bill, I know you've uh, covered uh, Artemis 1, and as has Irene, uh, but Bill, first, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, the prospects are for a launch in November, what's going on in the VAB right now, and uh, What's, uh, what's, what's ahead in November once the rocket gets out to the pad? Yeah, I think they're going to roll out around November 5th is the current uh, thinking, I believe. Uh, you know, they got to service these flight termination batteries. These are batteries in the self-destruct system that they cannot access at the launch pad. That, those always had a time limit on them during the earlier attempts, and they had to ultimately had to roll back, if for no other reason, than to service these batteries. Uh, you can ask why you have a rocket that has batteries that can't be serviced at the pad, and that's a good question. Uh, but basically, it's, it's it's the routine, get the rocket ready to go again. I think the real, the only thing you can say about the next launch opportunity is, will the, the, the hydrogen system leak again, or will it leak like it did the last time, but it's a manageable leak? And I think they're assuming that they'll have the same situation they had last time, which they believe they can safely manage and launch. So... You know, fingers crossed that, that uh, they'll, they'll get there this time. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it's a 12.07 a.m. launch. And while that really lights up the sky and that's quite spectacular, it's, it's awfully hard to see the rocket. But other than that, um, I've, I've got reasonable confidence they'll be able to get it off, you know, weather permitting. Yeah, we've brought up these launch times in November for this next launch period. And, man, they are, they are rough. 12.07 a.m., you know, 1 a.m., 7 a.m. Those are overnight countdowns to cover. Um, but uh, you know, we, we saw them fully load the uh, core stage and the upper stage with cryogenic uh, propellant back in that tanking test just before the rollback before Hurricane Ian hit Florida. And they were able to fully load the vehicle. But I, I've noticed, you know, we're talking about two hour launch windows here. And even when they have succeeded in loading the vehicle, they haven't really demonstrated, uh, at least in my memory, an ability to hit a two-hour launch window. So we could... uh, that, That's true, but I think the thing you have to keep in mind that in all of the attempts leading up to the last one, um, they were still figuring out what was going on. 
uh, with the leak rates in those umbilicals and how to manage it. Um, and I think they, I think they finally think they understand it. Now, will it cooperate with them next time? That remains to be seen. But I think they, they believe they understand the system well enough now that they do have time to get off. And I think there's some reasonable confidence they can do that. Irene, you talked about uh, how Starship fits into the Artemis program, and can you just give us kind of a refresher on you know, you know the history of the space launch system in a minute or two, if you can. It's a, quite a history, but a minute or two. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> condense a decade or more into a minute or two, and, and how how this fits into NASA's architecture. Um. Well, the space launch system, this flight is uh, going to put an uncrewed Orion spacecraft on a distant uh, orbit around the moon. And uh, the idea is that people will follow on a flight test in a couple of years, and then there'd be a crewed landing on the surface of the moon um, no earlier than 25. These dates seem quite tenuous to me, especially the landing on the moon date. Uh, for that, NASA needs a uh, system to transfer astronauts from Orion to the surface of the moon, and that's the Starship HLS version, human landing system version. And um, I don't know, you know, it, it's certainly a lot closer than uh, we were under Constellation, which was the last moon program that had a, a flight test. Um, of a, a kind of a smaller version of a rocket. And uh, I don't know, it sure would be nice to see it. It seems that there's, uh, you know, it's always like two steps forward, one step back. Yeah, we, no, we, I'd, I'd, I'd also on. ask Irene to, uh, you know, one thing you cannot escape in this environment that we're in is you've got the SLS rocket at $4.1 billion a copy for the first four rockets. And you've got SpaceX building the Starship, which I know we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, it, we don't know what that rocket's going to cost, but presumably way less than $4.1 And you have, I can't look at the Starship and think about Artemis without thinking about how does this all fit together? You know, how does it fit together? The, star, the SLS brings one great advantage to the table. They can launch, what, 30 tons to the moon right now in a single flight. And the Starship, you've got to refuel the Starship in Earth orbit multiple times before it goes to the moon. And that's a whole level of complexity we haven't even touched on yet um, in the space program. So I, I'd be curious, Irene, how do you see uh, uh, the Starship fitting in with all of this? Because it just seems like the, 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 the cost factor and the, and the technology involved is so vastly different. You know, NASA, when you ask NASA that question, they have a very truthful response, which is SLS exists and Starship is still in development. Um, and that is true. But as soon as, um, uh, depending on what happens with the SLS flight test and then how quickly SpaceX is able to do an orbital flight test of Starship and all of the other technical hurdles, the the that argument of well this exists and starship is still in development that's going to start going away and of course there's alternative art architectures for doing any kind of human deep space exploration program that if use what you have you know if you have starship you use starship but i think nasa's um you know, trying to find a way that includes both. And I will say one thing about the cost of SLS is that the way that NASA is funded is it, costs are put onto a program like SLS, but it actually funds centers and people. So it, it supports Marshall Space Flight Center, Kennedy, you know, big sections of, um, of, of Johnson and some of the other ones. So it's, it's almost a... Uh, like a big mixing of apples and oranges to start talking about the costs of these things. Um, NASA recently laid out this, this sort of blueprint for how it wants to go about scaling from lunar, lunar missions to Mars. And it, it is very much based on having a capability like SLS. Um, and I guess as long as that's the program of record, that's what they're going to be sticking with unless something radically changes. Yeah, but you know, and Stephen, I'm not trying to make this go longer than we had originally thought it is. The only other thought I'd add, though, is with the HLS, 
uh, Sp SpaceX, NASA is committed to having a <laughs> having an operational starship, uh, or yeah. they can't land on the moon. And so you've got they're funding competing rocket systems. It seems like you know to achieve the same objective, which seems like a interesting way to run a railroad. Put it that way. Hey, NASA loves redundancy, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what cost, though? Yeah. Um, so we, we've talked about waiting for this Artemis One launch and. Um, the first Starship orbital test flight has seen its share of delays as well, although not as long. Uh, but we've waited longer than what uh, Elon Musk had uh, suggested a couple of years ago. Um, and we saw this tweet from Elon uh, a few days ago talking about proceeding very carefully as they move forward in the Starship testing down in Texas. If there is a RUD, as he called it, that's a, a, basically an explosion, a rapid unscheduled dis, uh, disassembly on the pad, he said the Starship progress will be set back by six months. And we've seen multiple explosions during testing of uh, Starship uh, hardware uh, in the past few years. So it's not out of the question that uh, that may happen again as they progress into flight testing. So just wanted to get your thoughts. Either one of you jump in as we talked about NASA relying on Starship for landing on the moon. SpaceX in their vision and their plan seems increasingly reliant on Starship to get the Starlink network up to a profitable mode. And obviously for Elon's, uh, Elon Musk's long-term vision of putting a civilization or putting human civilization onto Mars, something like the Starship is essential for that. Um, do you think maybe SpaceX seems to be taking, you know, getting to the point with the Starship program where there's a lot riding on it and they're moving from one phase of development where an explosion on the pad is, you know, they can brush off their shoulder. And if it happens again, especially getting up to a full up uh, orbital flight test with the pad fully outfitted, something like that would be a huge setback. Well, I would just say that SpaceX, they, I, there will be failures. And there, as Bill was mentioned earlier, they're quite agile in recovering from them. And they also don't seem to be impeded by things that seem very daunting, like how long did it take to rebuild the Airy, the Antares pad out at Wallops after the accident? It was a couple of years. Um, you know, they seem to be able to turn around pretty quickly. Of course, you know, it depends what happens, but. Yeah, this goes back to the whole the whole risk aversion question that we talked about near the beginning of, of different approaches to risk by SpaceX and NASA. And it seems like almost watching the commercial crew program, commercial cargo, and now potentially HLS, there seems to be almost a meeting in the middle in some cases of SpaceX and NASA and, and their different approaches, different cultures. And um, we've obviously... NASA doesn't want to take huge risk. I remember a couple of years ago when Jim Bridenstine, the former administrator, uh, kind of floated the idea of launching crew on Artemis 1. Can you imagine that if we were on the cusp of Artemis 1 with astronauts on it? Uh, how crazy <laughs> crazy that would be to be preparing to cover. But, um, you know, we talked about what SpaceX plans is for, are for Starship looking ahead. Uh, we've seen uh, groups like Polaris Dawn, Jared Isaacman, uh, book a flight on Starship down the road. There's the Dear Moon uh, project uh, uh, with the, the Japanese billionaire, uh, I think uh, Yusaka Mazawa, is booked a flight on the Starship. And last week we just uh, heard from uh, Dennis Tito, the original space tourist. Uh, he and his wife want to take a ride around the moon on the Starship. Um, I know this is I mean, way down the road. Uh, Bill, any thoughts on how soon something like this may be possible with Starship, get it human rated for a moon flight? No, I, I don't. And and part of the reason for that is what we talked about earlier. We don't really have any insight into their schedules in any detail. Uh, I think, you know, the lesson I take away from SpaceX is they, Elon Musk likes to make, you know, tell us in briefings and events when something might happen. It's almost never accurate. You know, it's always longer than that. So I don't know when Starship will be human rated, but I think it will be. I mean, you know, you can't talk about the dates, but I agree with Irene. They will make this work sooner or later. I believe that. Um, the question is, can they can they make it work, you know, repeatedly uh, and keep people's confidence in it up and not have the kind of setbacks you were talking about a, a few minutes ago? You know, I think this whole issue of refueling Starship to go to the moon or anywhere into deep space, you know, a lot of flights are involved here and they've all got to work. 
You know, so there, there's some inherent risk in the architecture that they've got to prove they can do it. Now, you know, you, nobody sells SpaceX short these days. You know, watching a Starship, I mean, a, a, a Falcon 9 do a landing and you, you don't sell them short. They clearly have very smart people working for them in designing very clever engineering solutions to these problems, but they've got to make it work and do it repeatedly with a gigantic rocket. And you, you, you can't under, understate the challenge of all of that. I believe they'll do it, but I think it's going to take longer than folks are expecting. Irene, you know, talking about space tourism on the Starship does seem a ways off, but uh, we've already seen some uh, commercial astronauts uh, fly on Crew Dragon. Uh, we saw the Axiom flight to the space station, Inspiration 4, uh, about a year ago now. And you had some interesting stories uh, from IAC about uh, some nation states, uh, governments actually signing up for commercial uh, flights on Dragon uh, to space station through, I think, through Axiom. And uh, uh, I think they've contracted with SpaceX for those flights, if I, my memory serves. Uh, t can you talk about the evolution? We, we talk about Dennis Tito as the original space tourist, which I guess in some ways he really wasn't uh, because there were flights back in the 90s to Mir, if I recall, uh, by a journalist and, and uh, TV uh, personality. But uh, looking you know, ahead to commercial flights on Dragon. Uh, we've talked about the idea. We heard a few weeks ago, Jared Isaacman and SpaceX are involved in a study with NASA about servicing Hubble. Just some of the applications that maybe weren't originally foreseen under the original NASA crew contract, or maybe they were, and, and it, some of that stuff just coming to fruition. Just your thoughts on how that's evolved. Uh, quickly, <laughs> once, uh, once SpaceX started flying people it seemed to literally have just uh, taken off. You know, I was remembering recently about the, the one of the original proposals uh, for a, a commercial habitat was developed by Bigelow Aerospace. And uh, perhaps the flaw in that plan is that he was completely dependent on the transportation um, sector coming to fruition uh, far early, far later, it turns out than it actually did. And they financially couldn't keep it together. Uh, the Axiom deals are quite interesting because they're contracting now with government. So, uh, you know, the old school way of get to space is you partner with the United States or Russia and contribute modules or science experiments or something. And it was government to government uh, barters and and some in, in some cases purchases like the U.S. rides on Soyuz. Um, but now uh, you governments can just buy it on the commercial market. Um, there was uh, Axiom uh, uh, at the IAC. There was a there was a um, an issue that came up on the very last day about the location for the conference in 2025, and Saudi Arabia had wanted it, and there were some objections for various reasons um, uh, that uh, culturally people had decided, the delegates decided not to um, pursue that and instead selected Sydney, Australia. But um, Axiom had just a couple of days before signed contracts to fly to um, Saudis on, uh, in fact, their next commercial flight to the space station. And it's just, you know, it's kind of interesting and we we're kind of see a little taste of this now, what's happening with um, Elon and the funding of Starlink in Ukraine, where private companies are kind of getting out a little bit ahead or maybe just moving alongside where governments are in international relations. But it's uh, it's good. I mean, what happens when, uh, you know, a private couple from China says that they, they want to fly and is that the way they'll end up at the space station? You know, it's kind of everything's getting shuffled. Yeah, it, do, it does raise a lot of uh, big questions going forward about, again, I think I mentioned up front, the a commercial private industry priorities competing with national priorities in some senses. Um, but I wanted to get both of your thoughts on an announcement we heard a few weeks ago about this study that NASA and SpaceX are partnering on about using a Dragon spacecraft to reboost and potentially service the Hubble Space Telescope, which hasn't been uh, serviced since uh, 2009 by the space shuttle. So it's been up there for 13 years without any repair job. Uh, Bill and then Irene, uh, can you each talk about sort of your first reaction to hearing that it kind of came out of the blue at least from my perspective yeah it did you know and of course uh, for viewers who don't follow this in any great detail i mean hubble 
you know, it's very high up, but it's but it still experiences atmospheric drag. So it's slowly coming down and it has no way to reboost its altitude. So eventually it's going to fall back into the atmosphere uh, and burn up. And that's projected to be as early as the mid 2030s. Now, can Hubble last that long and do useful science to that point? And even if it does, how would you ensure that when it does reenter the atmosphere, it does so over an unpopulated area of the ocean, for example? By either attaching a rocket motor to it or conversely boosting its altitude extending its scientific life and, and pushing that problem way down the road um you know i think spacex can do that i think that uh jared isaacman and the team they put together to study this uh can in theory you know either boost it with the crew dragon or attach a motor to it my guess is they'll do it with the crew dragon um i think they could do that but i think nasa is going to really study that uh, nobody wants to take a chance of knocking Hubble out of action by accident. Uh, even though it's more than 30 years old, it's still the premier science payload ever launched until Webb came along. So uh, they're not going to take any chances with it. That said, I don't see any uh, insurmountable engineering problems. I think they could probably do it as long as they can convince everybody it's safe. Yep, Irene, what, did you, what, did your, what was your reaction uh, to that story? Um. Well, to me, it seemed that the uh, the rate of descent is not Hubble's life limiting problem, um, right. and it also depends a little bit about when this mission would occur. Because right now, the projections are that, um, uh, well, as the program manager told me, um, uh, he said it's kind of a horse race as to what's gonna what's gonna go. The leading issue right now is the fine guidance sensors. Um, they're working, and uh, but they're they need a little uh, special care in uh, how they're how they're managed. There's issues with the gyroscopes, and there's other uh, you know other it, it's down to one side of a of a science instrument and data handling system. So there's other things besides the altitude that are an issue with Hubble. So. Um, whether people get comfortable with the idea of using it as a test bed so SpaceX can practice rendezvous and docking and you know the whole idea that it's 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 would be naive to say that you're, we're going to boost Hubble and therefore we're going to save it. The other things are um, I don't know if you remember Stephen but um, during the last Hubble servicing mission it was actually delayed a year because Hubble shut down uh, um, an unexpected problem. It was very right before they were going to launch, and it ended up uh, adding an additional, pretty major repair task to the crew's um, um, to-do list, and the flight was actually delayed. So, say you have, say this Dragon reboost mission is approved, and then Hubble goes into a safe mode or has some other issue that the team is trying to fix with software developments and stuff. Do you? canceled the reboots, like what happens with all of that. So again, it's like our, our brave new world, there's all kinds of new relationships that are emerging from it. Um, I had some other questions, I guess, as a re recovering business writer is, does, you know, what kind of insurance would SpaceX and the, and the uh, Polaris program need to get? And could you even like insure, like, what, would you, what are you gonna insure about? The, the issues with approaching Hubble would be that, there's plume impingement on the solar arrays or some kind of contamination issue. Um, John Grunsfeld uh, was telling me the other day that, you know, one of the things they could do is like not close the aperture door, which they did for all the shuttle um, EVAs as to avoid contamination with the caveat being that there was always one EVA held in reserve in case they had to go out and, and make sure that the Hubble um, uh, aperture door uh, would open again. So, yeah. Do they skip doing that? There's a lot of there's a lot of issues with it. But you know, NASA Tom Zerbokin had a really great quote. He said, you know, we like crazy ideas. That's what we're here for. Um, I was a little concerned. It took three weeks for NASA to name the study team, and they're all at Goddard. I don't see any outside people on it. I don't know if that's good, bad, and different. But it's uh, these are the folks that came up with repair scenarios for Hubble and very enterprising um, uh, teams out there. So I'm sure that if they, uh, I'm sure they'll be able to come up with a way to do this. And I guess the bigger questions of, is it appropriate? Is it necessary that that's gonna be um, uh, not a technical uh, answer? 
Yeah, and, and two quick points I'd make is I think everybody should keep in mind we're not really talking about any kind of repair to Hubble or upgrades of its instruments. I don't think you can do that with a Crew Dragon. We're talking mostly reboost here, um, which which I think they could figure a way to do. However, I think one thing we got to keep in mind is is Hubble's 32 years old right now, and by the time a mission like this gets up there, we're talking about a very old telescope, um, and you can you can make all kind of arguments about, well, then why not risk it, right? If you get a few more years out of it, and this is a way to do it, let's go for it. Uh, it's not like it's still a brand new, in, in 1986 dollars, $2.5 billion telescope. That's not the case. Uh, so I, you know, I think it'd be kind of fun if they could figure out a way to do it and if they could get a couple more years out of it. Yeah, indeed. And we've seen Jared Isaacman. He was the commander of Inspiration4. Uh, he is signed up for three more flights with SpaceX, uh, one potentially sometime next year, which they're going to attempt to do the first first uh, commercial spacewalk outside of a Crew Dragon, which is requires, requires some modifications to the spacecraft and the development, um, more notably maybe, of, of a new spacesuit. And uh, it, it seems like Jared Isaacman's running his own uh, space program must be great to be Jared Isaacman uh, to fly these <laughs> missions to space and want to go save Hubble. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, so just want to get your impressions of, of that because he seems like he's genuinely interested in space and and he really gets a kick out of being involved in these matters and and what do you think his role is in something like this, especially like a Hubble mission? Well, Irene, I'll leave that one to you. Nice to be rich. <laughs> nice to be rich. I, you know, I, I agree, Stephen. I don't have any doubt that he's yeah. a very technically competent guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's, he flies fighter jets, uh, you know, for the fun of it. He's made a ton of money in a technological field. He, he's, he's clearly, a, you know, a guy who probably could have been selected as an astronaut if he'd ever tried to. He's certainly in that, in that league. Uh, I think the better question, or at least to me, the, the bigger question is, is what Irene alluded to is is what, how does the government get off hiring a private citizen to go service, you know, one of its premier payloads? That that seems unusual to me, and even though I'm kind of in favor of it because there really isn't anything else on the table right now, it does make me a bit uncomfortable. I'm not sure I really get that because no matter how confident he is, um, you know, when you think about a NASA crew going up there with years and years of very specific training simulations you know everything that goes into that uh, it's hard to see that they would be just as prepared uh, on a private mission you know it also occurs to me that there is the nasa left hubble with a uh, a soft capture uh, mechanism so that a vehicle which didn't exist at the time this was that servicing mission last servicing mission took place about a year and a half before dragon's first flight but um uh, left it in a way so that it could be visited by a vehicle without a robot arm in the future. So if it's a government need, and there's also a, uh, you know, a government budget associated with that, uh, maybe this would just speed things along for commercial alternatives for deorbiting or boosting Hubble as a mission, similar to how NASA came out recently with a uh, request for information of companies that had ideas on how to deorbit the ISS. So again, when you look at it as a commercially provided service, somehow that to me, it seems a little more in keeping with what the government's traditionally done rather than um, using a national asset like Hubble for, I don't know, a, a tech demo for SpaceX and and a and a you know a, an interesting mission for Jared Isaacman. Yeah, that's it's it does raise a lot of questions, and it's certainly something to keep watch of over the next uh, few months as we see how this study uh, progresses and uh, wait for an outcome or a briefing from NASA or SpaceX on what the study determined is it technically feasible. But uh, before we conclude, I wanted to move on to at least one more thing. Uh, which is the uh, debut launch of ULA's United Launch Alliance's new rocket, the Vulcan Centaur, uh, which Irene, you and uh, Joey Roulette from Reuters uh, broke the story last week that it's uh, going to be delayed till the first quarter of 2023. Um, Irene, can you talk about what you learned from your chat with uh, Tori Bruno from ULA? 
Sure. Um, so they are making progress uh, with the Blue Origin provided uh, BE-4 engines for the rocket. And uh, Tori believes that it would have been close to do a flight in December, but he doesn't really have to have that stress because his primary payload, um, the uh, astrobotic Peregrine Lunar Lander is not gonna be ready to fly. And uh, he had no compunction whatsoever about squarely putting the, uh, the schedule driver on Astrobotic. Um, so that is where all of that, uh, that stands. The delay also meant that um, they picked up another secondary uh, couple of test satellites for the Amazon Kuiper uh, LEO broadband system. Uh, Tori said that it kind of gave, gave them an opportunity to get a head start on doing some of the payload integration that um, ULA is gonna be doing to fly Kuiper, the operational constellation on um, both Atlas V and the, and the Vulcan rockets. And uh, ABL, uh, a startup um, that has yet to reach orbit, um, had a contract for those two satellites and that, that contract still remains in play, but it'll be for a different, um, different, different spacecraft now. Space program, we've talked about the space launch system. Um, where is ULA in this picture, Bill? Well, actually, I was just going to ask Irene another question about her interview with Tori, which is reusability yeah. and the Atlas and the Vulcan, because it's difficult to see how any company can compete with a rival that has a reusable rocket system. You know, Starship will, in theory, be fully reusable, and the Falcon 9, you're getting the first stage back in the fairings. Uh, so what did he say about that, Irene? You know, back when they first talked about this, they talked about cutting away the engine section and yeah. ladders and ocean recovery and all of that. When might we see something like that happen now? So they revised their recovery engine recovery plan a bit, and uh, they're going to just use an inflatable aeroshell and drop the engines into the ocean, really simplify things a lot. There's a test on the JPSS2 launch uh, this weekend that's going to test this decelerator. And um, basically, uh, Tori says that he, they've always had this engine reused in the back burner, but when they got Looks like we lost the connection with uh, Irene there, uh, but uh, we'll try to get her back uh, momentarily because that's a, an important topic of learning about uh, ULA's development of the Vulcan rocket and uh, her really interview with uh, Tori Bruno to give us an update, uh, to give the public an update on where that stands in development. Again, the first Vulcan launch has been uh, delayed now to the first quarter of 2023. Uh, but while we try to get Irene back, I want to move on to uh, another story that we covered recently which was the uh, impact of the DART spacecraft, NASA's double asteroid redirection test with uh, uh, asteroid Dimorphos, which is actually a moonlet of a larger asteroid. Here's a view from uh, a, uh, an Italian CubeSat that was riding along with uh, the DART spacecraft when, it's made, when it made its destructive uh, collision with uh, the asteroid. It destroyed the spacecraft and it left a plume of material erupting uh, kind of trailing this asteroid that was still visible for days through telescopes. Do we still have Bill? Oh, yeah. I'm yeah, still yeah, here. yeah. I'm uh, looking at your picture. Uh, Bill, you, yeah, you, you covered this and uh, just wanted to uh, see what uh, your impressions were of this uh, planetary defense test. I thought it was a very impressive success. Uh, you know, when you think about uh, hitting a target and at the time of the impact, you know, Dimorphos was 7 million miles away, and you've got a very small spacecraft moving at 14,000 miles an hour, basically making a, a, a bullseye hit on the asteroid. It's a convincing demonstration that the technology exists to properly target a kinetic impactor, as they call these things. And it gives you some hope that down the road, if you, know, you ever spot a larger body or even a, a body of this size coming toward Earth, that you at least have some recourse, some way to nudge it off course. You know, I think everybody remembers the movies Armageddon, you know, Deep Impact, and, you know, you're taking nuclear weapons up, you know, and you're trying to blow the asteroid up. What you're really trying to do is nudge it off course, and you don't need a big weapon there. What you need is an advanced warning. And, of course, that means NASA needs to fully map out 
the threatening bodies that cross Earth orbit uh, to give you a, a much better chance of identifying a threat in time to send a rocket out, hit it far enough away, nudge it off course so it misses the Earth. I thought as a proof of concept, it was a brilliant success. It's almost like hitting a bullet with a bullet. You know, it's a, a, a tremendous technological achievement, I think. Uh, but whether or not that translates into an actual uh, system that could be used on short notice in the future, I think that remains to be seen. But clearly, the technology exists to do it. Yeah, that, that was uh, an impressive thing to watch in real time, to watch that asteroid grow bigger and bigger in the field of view of DART's camera. Really fascinating as, you know, it was just a fuzzball, even five minutes, ten minutes before impact, and then you got down to the granular granular level of seeing little individual rocks and boulders just before impact. And you mentioned the advanced warning piece, Bill, and I know one of NASA's plans after DART in this realm of planetary defense is to build an infrared survey telescope that I think is going to be designed to uh, detect up to 90% or at least 90% of the potentially hazardous asteroids that are out there. Um, you mentioned Armageddon, these uh, Hollywood blockbuster movies that we've seen nuclear devices uh, be used to divert asteroids off of a collision course with Earth. Um, but really the key is, is is finding these things decades or centuries in advance, right, Bill? Oh, no question about it. You know, the further out the, the, the threatening body is, the less force is required uh, to nudge it off course. You know, a small push can make it miss Earth if you if you do it soon enough. You can't wait till the last minute. That's when, that's when that, that is Armageddon, right? That's when you have to send up the big stuff. But uh, no, the goal is to spot them, identify them, uh, make sure that that you you know you have the ability to to, to get there in time to to stop a problem. But I, you know, I think, like I said, I mean, Dark clearly was a successful proof of concept. Uh, now, if they if they can get the satellite built and get the, the the telescopes on the ground to identify all these threats, then all to the better. Irene, one thing we're going to be watching going forward, and I'm glad we're, we have you back just for our last couple of minutes here is uh, the launch of the next batch of OneWeb satellites this weekend on an Indian uh, GSLV Mark III rocket. I think that launch is scheduled for Saturday afternoon, U.S. time. Uh, we haven't seen a OneWeb uh, launch. OneWeb, of course, is the uh, one of the competitors, uh, so to speak, of, of the Starlink network, one of the other companies that's building a mega constellation of Internet satellites. Uh, they had some issues with their launch service provider, with the Soyuz, Russian Soyuz rocket after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But they're back on the launch pad, Irene. Uh, you had a story on Aviation Week uh, in the last couple of days about that. Uh, are they back on track? Irene, I don't think we're, we're hearing you. I'm not sure if you're, if you're muted there or if there's some other issue. Uh, can you hear me? I am hearing her. I have you loud and clear, Irene. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Just similar redundancy, we need it. <laughs> um, I was just saying that uh, OneWeb had uh, kind of a rocky road uh, to get to this point. This is the second time they're um, restarting a launch campaign. Uh, they had launched three times and then filed for bankruptcy and then took eight or nine months came back with a new launch contract with uh, Ariane Spas and de um, deployed about 60% of the constellation and uh, then ran into the issue with um, the, uh, with the, with the, with the Russians and uh, flying on Soyuz, as, as you'd mentioned, Stephen. So uh, yeah, now they're back with India and uh, they're still proceeding with plans to launch on SpaceX, although uh, no comment from the company about the, um, plan, uh, the initial plan was targeting a SpaceX OneWeb launch as early as this past summer, which obviously didn't happen. So I'm not really sure when the SpaceX flights will happen, but yeah, it looks like OneWeb is uh, back on track again. And uh, Bill, do you have any thoughts about uh, where OneWeb stands uh, right now? No, because I, I feel like they're they're really different markets from what what Starlink is trying to do, and of course when Amazon comes online with Kuiper, um, you have a bunch of market segments in this whole uh, uh, internet from space architecture. But one thing we didn't get a chance to talk about was the impact of all of this on astronomy. It's an amateur astronomer has strong feelings about that, 
but that's that that's the train that seems to have left the station. We're 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 on the verge of having low Earth orbit seriously populated with these constellations, and that's going to be interesting in its own right from a uh, you know collision standpoint, space debris, astronomy, you name it. Uh, but the thirst for high speed internet anywhere in the world is insatiable. And uh, these things are happening. So it's going to be uh, really interesting to see how it plays out. We're going to close out to, with one more look ahead to the upcoming launch of SpaceX's a Falcon Heavy rocket that's currently scheduled for Halloween from here at Kennedy Space Center uh, with a U.S. Space Force payload on board. This is uh, going to be the fourth flight of the Falcon Heavy, which is we've talked about the uh, space launch system. We've talked a lot about Starship, but I'll remind our listeners that Falcon Heavy is currently the world's most powerful operational rocket uh, by some measure. And uh, with these 27 engines, three Falcon 9 boosters uh, bolted together, we see here uh, pictures from previous missions. And we've had some a long wait, uh, about three years since the last Falcon Heavy launched, primarily due to payload delays. It seems like every payload that was going to launch on Falcon Heavy has been snake bit with uh, with NASA's Psyche asteroid mission, uh, this Space Force payload had two years of delays on its own. And uh, some of the commercial payloads like Viasat have, have run into some supply, th supply chain issues as well uh, with their satellites that are booked on the Falcon Heavy. Uh, so this is going to be an interesting launch looking ahead uh, on Halloween Day of the Falcon Heavy. Uh, and Bill, uh, you've, you've been here for, I think, all of these Falcon Heavy launches. What's it like to watch one of these things launch? It's uh, it's really something. Uh, it is a, it's an event. You know, I always tell people that weren't around for space shuttle. None of these things equal space shuttle, in terms of shaking the ground and the roar and the sheer majesty of it. But the, but the Falcon Heavy comes pretty close. And if you're in Florida, you ought to try to get over to the East Coast and see it because it's a, it is a spectacle. Irene, you agree with me? I mean, I, I totally. keep the shuttle class by itself, but I'm yeah. Close. And to see the the uh, two side boosters come back oh, yeah. and that was phenomenal. I, we're not gonna see that on this flight, but um, maybe in the not too distant future. Yeah. I, I, I think we are actually, Irene. The latest news I got from uh, Space Systems Command at uh, Los Angeles Air Force Base who procures these rockets for the military is that this mission will have two, the two side boosters returning to nice. the landing zone at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, which I'll note, actually um I'm, i hope to learn from the space force before this launch happens is a change because when this launch was originally procured from uh spacex by the space force or the air force back then the two side boosters were yeah. going to be landing on the drone ships so it kind of begs the question of what yeah. changed in the mission profile over these last couple of years of delays to allow them to have enough performance uh or maybe the space force has uh gotten comfortable with uh, margins or, or something to allow SpaceX to be able to return those boosters mm -hmm. to land. But yeah. And is, what did they tell you about the core stage, Stephen? The core stage will be expended. So thought, will yeah. not be recovered, which of course space on the previous three Falcon heavy missions, the core stage was not recovered successfully. The first two, they crashed the second it did land, but uh, tipped over soon after landing. So they, SpaceX is still in, the experimental phase, so to speak, of recovering Falcon Heavy cores, but on this mission, there won't even be an attempt from from what uh, the Space Force is telling me. Uh, mm. So we'll look forward to that launch in just a couple of weeks and uh, busy November ahead, and we hope to yeah. uh, do this program again uh, sometime down the road and make this a more regular occurrence on Space Flight Now here on our YouTube channel. Uh, but we're going to close out uh, our first edition of News from the Press site. We want to thank Irene Klotz from Aviation Week and Bill Harwood from CBS News for joining us this afternoon. Thanks, Stephen. Thank y'all, and uh, y'all have a great day, and we'll see you next time. You too. Thanks.